Hello, everybody. My name is Leah. I'm the administrative assistant here at Africa Fire Mission. Welcome to our training today. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you coming and just to get to see everybody today is wonderful. Today we have Howard with us again. And he's going to be teaching a little bit about education tools um, and revisiting that topic again if you were here for the training he's done before with us. I just want to thank everybody for coming once again and remind you all to stay muted during the training. And if you have a question throughout the training, you are more than welcome to ask it. Just raise your hand and we can call on you or you can type it in the chat and I'll be monitoring that the whole time. And so I'll see your question or any problems you might be having. I'll keep track of those as well. And I also just wanted to remind everybody that this is a recorded training and we're going to be posting it on our YouTube channel later. So you can go back and view it if you want to, or you can share the video with your colleagues that might also be interested in the training. And I'm also going to be sending out certificates for everybody who attends at least 75% of the training. And if it's an hour long training, which they usually are, that looks like staying for roughly 45 minutes of the training. And so I'll be setting those out later today. Um, and I just want to pass it off to Jose now. He's going to share a little word of encouragement with everybody. Thank you, Leah. Uh, thank you, Howard, for uh, uh, coming through. We, we, we truly appreciate. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for finding time to, uh, to attend the class, the refresher class for today. And today, um, I just needed to read something for us, and I'm actually getting the reading from uh, the 90 Days of Encouragement. There's one time we gave all these books uh, in the symposium that we attended, and uh, it's written by uh, Craig Duck with uh, some of his friends, uh, Desla and, and Kay Helms and Rob Heat. They are all, they are, most of them are uh, chaplains in their fire departments. So allow me to read. It's not a long caption, but just try and get something out of it. It was really hard for me to explain it. And I was like, hey, why don't, they, why don't I just read it? Uh, the topic, uh, as I said, it's from the book of 90 Day Encouragement of uh, Overhauling Your Faith. So it's on day 15 of the book, and the day 15 goes uh, Toolbox or Tool Belt, written by Kate Helms. He's an international board member. Uh, he, he directs us to read Ephes Ephesians chapter 6. So firefighters often use the, use the reference to a toolbox when talking about specific tactics and resources. After attending a training session about a firefighting concept, you may hear firefighters say that they will put that in their toolbox. The intent is that they will store the concept in their mental toolbox so that they can put it out when the need arises. Examples include different types of nozzles, form application, types of ventilation, vehicular extrication techniques, among others. The point is that although the firefighter will not be using this every day, he wants to be able to utilize the concept or resources or resource when it will facilitate the mitigation of the incident. When you use this same reference to our spiritual lives, we face a problem that is very prevalent today. We often hear a good sermon on a biblical discipline that is maybe in a Bible study, prayer, fellowship, or worship. And we decide to place it in our spiritual toolbox. We confidently store it away with the thought that we will retrieve it when the need arises. Praying without ceasing, studying God's word, encouraging one another, loving and forgiving others. We place this in our toolbox until life's problem penetrate our sense of personal comfort and well-being. And when the problem arises, arise, uh, we scramble to locate our toolbox and find the appropriate tool that will number our pain, feed our desire for comfort, and fix the problem. 
I can only imagine God's disdain for our foolishness. A better reference for a, for a believer is a tool belt which is to be worn. A spiritual tool belt is to be worn at all times and can be likened to the spiritual armor as mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10 to 18. We recently posted a picture on Facebook of a firefighter kneeling as, at a fire with the caption, when life is too hot to stand, kneel. While this is good advice, we not only kneel at all times, why not, why not kneel at all times? Why wait until life gets difficult? Don't place your spiritual disciplines in a toolbox. Keep them tightly secured to your body. Keep them tightly secured to your body. Walking with Christ requires a tool belt, not a toolbox. Well, you've had it for yourselves. And uh, you can just sip it in. I hope you are listening to what the advice was saying on day 15 on the spiritual 90 days of encouragement. And uh, thank you for listening in. So back to you, uh, Leah, to tell us the next uh, stage. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, you always do such a wonderful job of just bringing a new um, word or just new text into the conversation in the mornings. I'm sorry, in the evenings for you guys. Um, but yeah. just thank you so much for that. And I want to yes. now pass it off to Howard Cohen. And thank you so okay. much again for joining us. You're on mute, Howard. Yeah, there you I'm go. On hi, hi, everybody. Now, let me share my screen real quickly. And... Um, uh, I got a broad, make this one wider, go to my share screen. Okay, give me a second here to get it all set up. And just take a, just take a second. This little box does not like to, to behave. So it gets tricky to get it the right size. All right, getting close. Uh oh, that needs to go over here. Okay, I think we're in business now. So, um, hi everybody. Uh, I'm uh, very happy, very excited to be back um, and um, Looking forward to seeing some of you next fall. So this is a, a, a class I gave a few months ago. And after I gave it, I was thinking, wasn't quite up to, I didn't quite meet my expectation. So I went back and I, I rethought thought about some of it, what I, what I was doing, and I, I made some changes. So if you, some of you were here um, before and you saw it, uh, some of it, this will be familiar but there'll be some new material. And also the other part that I think is, is really cool is that the way we set it up is that the next couple of weeks, or at least for sure for next week, there'll be a, a fellow named Ed Collette who'll be coming in and he's gonna take this to the next level um, in, in terms of um, you know um, extrication related skills and responding to MVAs, motor vehicle accidents. So, um, so there we go. Let me get started. As always, I'd like to thank everybody. I want to thank all of you for, for get, making time to be here. I know you had a lot of you are either getting ready to start your shift or you're at the end of your shift and uh, you could probably be much happier going home, but I appreciate that you're here to hear me out. And I want to thank all the firefighters all over the place from whom I've learned and have borrowed uh, unabashedly for making this training and other trainings. And um, I, I don't consider anything to be an original on my part, but taking uh, with the permission that I'm be from them, from them that I have permission to use it, that I'm not using it for personal profit or gain. So thank you to all the world's firefighters, and thank you again for all, all of what you guys do, and, and uh, men and women do in your countries. Um, so um, today we're going to look at um, let's see. today we're going to look at uh, safety considerations when responding to motor vehicle accidents, and also examine extrication options when you don't have power tools such as jaws of life. Uh, spreaders, cutters, rams, uh, power sawzalls, 
and uh, any other kind of power tool. You're there on the scene and you, all you've got are your hand tools. What, what are you going to do? How can you do stuff? So I've got, I've got some poll questions that I want to kind of start off with just to get a feel for where, we're com where people are coming from. Um, Leah, can you, can you put up the poll questions? So first poll question is, how many of you have access to power tools on your apparatus or in your, your, um, uh, your, your firehouse? How many of you have access to power oh. tools? Go ahead and, uh, and respond to the poll. <laughs> Let me do this with this image. Uh, in Maria Cani, we have what? Uh, we'll keep the poll running a little bit longer. We we have it in Maria Cani. Okay, can, can, are you on the phone? You can't, uh, you, you don't see the poll question? Yeah, I, oh. Okay. So we'll let it run for a minute to see as people click in. So far we're running a, about uh, a little bit more than half of you have access to power tools. Keep it going, let's see where, good, more, numbers going up. I'm gonna let it run until two minutes and then I'll end the poll. So, so far more, more of you have access to power tools and don't, that's good. Guess I could have asked another question and, and do the tools work? Because sometimes we have them, but they don't work. All right. Okay, I'm gonna end it here and uh, good. Okay, so um, there are the results. That's great that that so many of your your companies, fire brigades, have access to power tools. That's that's great. Now, here's the next poll question I want to ask. Um, Leah, can you? Okay, this question: How many of you actually trained with the power tools? And if you've, even if you, your, your department or your brigade doesn't have them, but you've trained elsewhere, like in a training, go ahead and put yourself down. Mark, mark that as having trained. Looks like it's uh, running about the same between those departments, those fire brigades that have the tools. Looks like most of you have used them, have trained on them. That's good. Let this poll run a little bit longer. Looks like I got a question. Oops. Would you like to unmute real quick and ask that question? Ambo, go ahead. You have a question, sir? I can see your hand raised. Thambo? Thambo, happy? You have a question? Go ahead and unmute. Uh, you can unmute. Just, uh, just unmute. Click. Yes, Tambo. Go ahead, please. Go ahead with the question. Yes, it was that question, uh, and then it gave two responses. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to say uh, I've trained with with the tools. Great. Okay. So it looks it's pretty much play, it looks like those of you who have those tools have had some training on them. That's great. So um, we'll move on to, we're gonna skip the third poll question that I had and kind of ju start jump, jump in. So um, 
let's see, what do I have to do to share the results and stop sharing? Let's get rid of that. Um, nope. So, oh, there's the click, get rid of the button. Got it. Um, so um, now as we go through this, my training, I have it interspersed with quotes. These are kind of inspirational training related quotes. Uh, I'm just gonna pause for as we get to them and uh, I'll read them because not all of you can, are, are able to see the screen. And then we'll, we'll just kind of, you'll see they're just things to keep you, keep you thinking. So, um, do you have another question? No, I guess not. Okay. So know your capabilities, know your equipment, know your crew, know your options, know your resources, know your communication plan and train, train, train. Every motor vehicle accident is different. There's differences. In, the differences include the type of vehicles involved, the number of vehicles involved, the location of the incident, the resources available, whether they're human or mechanical, the time of day, the weather conditions. All of these things factor in when you respond to an MVA. Um, these are all things that, of course, you all know because we all know that this is just a given. But it's it's always worth remembering that, when, especially when we're doing training. Because too often we train in ideal conditions. So just remember, there's no ideal way. There's no perfect way. There's no only one way to do any of this work. No matter what, it's a good idea to have a standard, proven, effective set of SOGs or SOPs. So standard operating guidelines or standard operating procedures. So in, um, in, in here in North America, we have a bit of a debate that, that's been ongoing for a while, whether to call them standard operating guidelines or standard operating procedures. They're, for all intent and purposes, they're one and the same thing, but um, there seems to be some question as to whether or not one is, has more legal, uh, more of a legal consequence. But the important thing is that you have a standard set of, of how you're gonna operate and respond to things. That doesn't mean that's the only way to respond. It means that you and your team and your fire brigade know we respond to a motor vehicle accident. These are the steps we're going to go through. Um, I, I'm going to, uh, we'll share with Leah afterwards a set of uh, SOG, SOPs that I developed for my fire department a couple of years ago. Um, I, you're welcome to use these as a basis for what you use in your department if you don't have any. So now I want to ask another a poll question. Um, Leah, can you pop up this other poll question for me? Did I share it with you? Maybe I didn't share this one with you. Um, nope, not that one, sorry. Let me ask you this question anyway, and just, you can answer in the chat because I, I forgot to give this one to Leah. How many of your fire brigades actually have SOPs or SOGs or whatever you call them in your respective countries for responding to motor vehicle accidents? Now, nah, we'll, we'll leave it, Never mind. So just, just answer in the chat, how many of your fire brigades have an SOP, SOG, or whatever you call it, a standard operating way of responding that everybody gets trained on for motor vehicle accidents. Go, just go ahead and put in the chat your, the, your, if you have or haven't. I'll put, up the, uh, I'll put up the chat response. So are you guys gonna respond for me? How many of you have SOGs or SOPs? No, no one's responding. <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, I guess yeah, the chat, well, oh, it's Hello. coming, here we go, okay. Hello. No. Hello. Yeah? We have a well, no. No, uh, I'm saying. Hello. Yeah, go Hello. ahead. We can hear you. Yeah, you can hear. Now I'm saying that uh, we are trying to develop uh, some, but uh, we haven't started using them. You haven't started using them, okay. Okay. All right, so um, I'll, I'll have these available for Leah to, to share with you afterwards, but they're really important so that you have consistency when you respond to, uh, to calls. So let's talk about what we're doing. The ability to extricate a patient in a safe and fast way is because of something called the golden hour. The golden hour, I don't know if you've heard of this or if you use a similar term, 
But here in North America, the golden hour is what the medical world has, de has determined that that it, you need to get somebody to, you know, uh, in appropriate medical care, not just, you know, emergency first aid, but into a hospital or into a paramedic's hands within an, within the, uh, the hour to improve their chances of, of survival. Um, so for, for us in the, in the fire service responding to a, an MVA, it's really important to be able to get them out of the car as fast as possible and as safely as possible. And we need to have a team approach when we do this. Um, a team approach means that you have a pre-plan that you're gonna work from, which comes from your SOG or SOP. It means you train together. And, and whatever possible, it means you have pre-assigned jobs. So when you arrive on the scene, you know who's gonna do what, who's gonna grab what tools. And the only way you can be prepared like this is if you do it beforehand through a lot of practice. You can't do it, you can't get the practice by just responding to the calls. So again, the golden hour is providing medical aid within the first 60 minutes to an injured or sick person. I wanna reiterate what I just said about practicing all this stuff before you get to the scene, because you're not gonna, you, you gotta know it that really cold before you get there. And the only way you can do that is through practice. So here's something I picked up that's new, and it's, a, it's an acronym for helping to remember the steps in, in the process. And I'm gonna share it with you. I picked it up from another fire department. It wasn't one, something we were using in my department, but I, I liked it. I like acronyms. Acronyms help us remember steps, um, but don't get hung up on them. It's just a way to work us through, and this will also gives you, the, gives you a sense of what's coming up. So you have this word shade. Shade, right? We love shade, get out of the sun but it helps us to remember the first thing we have to do when we respond to a motor vehicle accident, we have to size it up. And then we have to have, we have to stabilize the car and we have to make sure that we have scene safety. I'm gonna talk more about all these steps as we go through this. Um, a stands for access. How do we access the, the patient in the vehicle? Then we have to assess their, their condition and then we have to assist them. And then we have D, which is disentanglement, which means how do you pull the car apart in order to get the person out, which brings us to E, which is to extricate them, getting them out of the, of the, the car mess that they're in. So shade is just a, a, a helpful thing to remember. It's the kind of thing that when your tone goes off and, you, and you're jumping to your, tr your apparatus, your truck, and you're heading to your scene, you can remind yourself, shade, right. First thing I got to do, size up, stabilize, scene safety. You can kind of go through this and remind you of your main steps that you need to, need to do. So um, I'm going to spend a lot more time on, on stabilizing and sizing up. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about scene safety here. And I'll do a little bit more a little further on. Um, so um, scene safety, when you want to think about that, you want to think in terms of four zones. You have an interior zone. That's your four, four zones are number one, interior. That's where your patient is, inside the car. Then you have what we, we call a hot zone, which is everything immediately adjacent to the vehicles, where you're going to be working to extricate the patient. You have a warm zone, which is an area that kind of is out, just outside of the hot zone, but it's close enough for where you can stage your tools um, and things like that. Um, and then you have a, um, a cold zone and the cold zone is where you're going to, you're going to push people back. You know, you have your, your, your media, you have bystanders where you stage your ambulance and things like that. You might put your command post there. Your command post might be in your warm zone, your warm zone. You might have uh, a charged line. Uh, so in case there's a fire, um, but you want to, you, you want to, you know, create, space and uh, thinking in terms of these four zones is really helpful. When you're thinking in terms of scene safety, there's really three groups of people you need to be concerned about. First and foremost is yourself as a rescuer. And secondly, it's the patient. Well, really patient and, and rescuer, you're both are both highest priority, but you also have to be concerned about the safety of, 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 of uh, uh, bystanders and the media and your support staff that are say like in an ambulance staging. So you have to think big picture and also very small, very narrow picture when you're thinking safety. We're gonna talk more about safety in the next slide. Um, 
So when you're securing the scene and you're making it safe, one of the most important things, two of the most important, three of the most important things, absolutely, that you need to take care of are you need to make yourself visible. You need to be as visible to oncoming uh, cars as possible. Um, studies here in the United States have found that um, being struck by uh, a car at a motor vehicle accident is one of the leading causes of death and injuries to first responders. And included in first responders are fire, medical, and even tow truck, tow truck drivers of, and police are all in that same category. So you have to be really, really visible. Here, we wear high visibility vests, which is what this character has got on. Um, so you also need to, you also need to um, block oncoming traffic. There's a lot to, to, to do to that. And it really depends on what kind of materials you have, what kind of roads you're working on what kinds of resources you have, but you have to be really careful about how you block traffic. I'll show some slides about that coming up. And you have to don appropriate PPE. Now for us, appropriate PPE, and I, I would hope for you guys, includes a helmet, eye protection, good gloves, like leather gloves, your, whatever you wear for your outer clothing, your bunkers, we call them bunkers, your coat, your pants, safety boots. You might need a mask to keep, uh, glass or fumes from, from uh, and glass and fumes from getting in your, in your uh, uh, you know, getting into your system. So you wanna wear appropriate PPE, you wanna block the traffic to make yourself as safe as possible there and you wanna make sure that you're as visible as possible. And by the way, when you are approaching the cars, you always wanna approach at an angle, about a 45 degree angle. You never wanna approach the car front on. There's two reasons for that, one is, if the car engages and goes into gear, you could get run over. Another reason is, is that those bumpers sometimes have these, uh, depending on the age of the car, they have these, uh, uh, they're, they, they're designed to be projected um, out. And there's things that could uh, shoot out and you don't wanna be in the way of those things. So uh, you always wanna approach from, from an angle. Okay, when you approach the car, um, this is really step two in, in a, and the SOGs for us, you want to be aware of what your hazards are. And that's H also, that's, that's in, the, in the shade. What are your hazards? So you look for hazards above. Are there wires there? Are there branches that are going to fall? Um, you look below, are there things wires underneath the car? Is there fuel leaking? Um, so you're looking all around, really doing a, um, a 360 degree up and down and all around checking for any kind of hazards as you, as you approach the car. You're also looking for thrown passengers. As you all know, if you're not wearing seatbelts in your cars, uh, people get projectiled out of their vehicles. So you're also looking for the thrown, for, for any thrown passengers. Um, so, you know, for the sake of time, I, I'm just gonna put these questions out there for you to ask yourselves and uh, to bring back to your, your, uh, your fire brigades. Number one, do you, have high visibility vests and do you wear them all the time when you're responding to, to motor vehicle accidents? Don't need to respond, just ask yourself the question, maybe bring it back to your, your fire brigade. If you don't have high visibility vests, can you get them? Do you have a budget for them? They're easy to get, uh, you know, you can buy a lot of stuff at Walmart. What about traffic cones? Do you have those for blocking or diverting traffic? If you don't, what do you use? How do you divert traffic? Um, we are required to use certain kinds of traffic cones. They have to be a certain height and a certain color, but that's because we have a lot of rules that, that govern us. But again, um, when you're responding to a motor vehicle accident, you're on the side of the road someplace, you are at great risk of getting injured. So you need to be really careful that you're, that you're easily visible to people and also that you're blocking traffic or diverting it in a safe way. Uh, this is not a traffic incident man management course. So I'm not going to talk a lot about how to do that, though in my next slide, I will show you a little bit on, on the, uh, what, what we do. <clears throat> so you're establishing the safety zone. You got to block your, you got to block traffic. Notice the fire apparatus here, how they're blocking on an angle, um, two lanes. Now, in this case, they're blocking because of where the cars are. They're blocking, but notice that they're on an angle. The reason why they're on an angle might be obvious, it might not, but it's simply because if somebody plows into the fire truck that's blocking the road and it's pointed in the same direction as where the accident is, 
it could easily push the fire truck into the accident scene and cause further injuries to you as first responders or to the, to the patients. So um, here you can see it marks the, the hot zones and the warm zones. Everything outside of the warm zone, it would be your cold zone. Again, the slide tells you what goes in those areas. And then the, the, the fourth zone would be the interior zone inside the vehicles. So once the other S that we're gonna talk about, and I'm gonna spend a bit of time with this one now is called stabilization. Now here's where um, your improv impro improvisation skills come into play because um, every situation with a well, MVA is different and you need materials to stabilize the car. Now, why do you need to stabilize the car? Well, if you don't, you're at risk of getting injured as um, yourself at, at, if the car moves while you're working on a patient or you're at risk of, of hurting the patient. So it's critical to stabilize the car. Now, if the car is on its wheels, it's not so hard to stabilize. One thing you could do is just let the tire air out of the tires. Um, you know, you could do that either by pulling the valve, but a much simpler way is to take a, a pointed tool, whatever you have, and puncturing the top half of the tire to let the air out. Then it flattens it right out. And now you at least, now all it's, you can chalk it and it's kind of harder to roll. By the way, it's really important that when, if you, if you puncture the tire, you puncture the top half, because if you do the lower half, your puncturing tool will likely get stuck in the hole by as the weight of the tire sits on it. So once you flatten the tires, then you're going to have to put chocks, some sort of blocks to keep it from rolling because it still can roll even on flat tires. And that's what stabilization is all about. Now, there's when you're stabilizing a vehicle, you're thinking there's, there's basically two kinds of cars. There's bricks and there's balls. So what I mean by that is that an old car is kind of like a brick. They tend to be square. Square things can be kind of easy to, to uh, stabilize, to make firm, you know, because they're square, right? They they're tend to sit flat. Newer cars tend to be round, and we call them balls, and they require a whole a little bit more sophistication and technique to keep them stable. But you have to, part of your scene safety with size up is stabilization, and you have to do stabilization before you get work, get, start working on your patients. So I'm going to run through a few slides. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the way stabilization, how, what kinds of what you need to think about with regards to stabilization. And by the way, notice that these, these uh, chocks or these cribbing, um, the cribbing that's being used here. This is just wood that's glued and nailed together. Any scrap wood you find can be, can be rigged into being used for, for stabilization purposes. And I'll have another picture of that too coming on, stuff that you could do. All right. So... We're talking about stabilization, this is critical again in terms of patient safety and, and during rescue. Whether you're using power tools or hand tools, you got to stabilize the vehicle. So um, you got to think in terms of horizontal movement. Okay, car can move forward or backwards. So easy, easy to address. Put something in front of the wheels and behind the wheels, chocks, which you probably do on your fire trucks anyway, just so they don't roll roll away. And then there's up and down movement. Okay, um, if it's car is sitting on its top, um, it could pivot back and forth. Or if it's a rounder car, it's got room to move. So the moving up and down, you've got to stabilize that way. The yaw movement, that's, that's rotating around. Much happens much more on uh, uh, round cars, um, but it's when the car kind of starts to pivot front to back, um, you know, kind of like it's rolling around. You have to think about that when you're stabilizing. And then there's um, rolling. So the car doesn't roll over. Car on its side could roll over. These are just all the different sides and ways a, a, um, a vehicle can needs to be stabilized. And then um, the last one is pitch. Again, it's the, the drawing shows if it's pivoting on something, it can pitch up and down. I'm showing all these to you. Um, we're not going to go into stabilization in detail. There's a lot to do. There's all kinds of ways to do it. But you just need to take this all into account as you approach the scene to make it safe and a stable scene. Here's a couple pictures of, of cribbing you can make out of your own. These are four by fours, or four inches by four inches. Uh, I, I'm not good with centimeters, but you get the sense. Um, and uh, these are, they're stacked up together. The stacked up ones are easy to shove underneath the car and you can keep putting it in to get deeper, get, get more and more purchase. And notice up here, 
These are slanted. This one here is slanted. That's so you can wedge in. And also, just as a note, um, notice how they're spaced out. So you they stack up kind of like to, um, to get height. So cribbing, easy to do, easy to make, really important. You don't have to spend a lot of money on that, um, but uh, cribbing is important for stabilizing. I would not advise using things like cinder blocks, which might be available because cinder blocks can uh, can crush much easier than uh, than the wood can. So we've stabilized the vehicles. We've uh, chopped or released the tire pressure, and now um, we need to have access. So we need to we need to try and get inside the uh, the car. Um, Number one thing to do when you try to get inside a car, you try the door to make, see if it's, you can get open the door up. So um, ideally, if it's possible, you want to access from the driver's side first. This is so you can make sure that the car gets turned off, uh, which, is, which is critical. You'd have that car turned off. And um, you can also turn on the hazard lights. The reason why this is important is because when your hazard lights are on, it tells all your other first responders that the car is still, the battery is still connected, which means it could set off your um, uh, uh, airbag. Um, it, it could, it could uh, release your airbags. It could, there could be electrical connections. There could, it, could it could restart, it could ignite. So it's an important, it's a little trick to do to keep people informed. Here's something, it's a good idea when you remove the keys from the car, Put them on top of the car. And everybody knows that's where they are. If at the end of the extrication, you can actually drive the car off the road, then you know where the keys are. So um, it's, a, it's a useful habit as opposed to putting them in your pocket or tossing them into the grass. The other thing you want to try and do is to release the hood. If you can release the hood from the hood release, you do so, and that'll enable you to get access to the battery to where you can either disconnect it or you can cut the cables. It's also, if the car is still on and you can get inside, you can lower windows so you don't have to pop them out. Could make um, access to the to patients easier. You might even be able, you might, you might have power locks depending on the age of the car. So you could release the power locks. All useful things to do once you've uh, attempted access. Now, you do need to be careful. Um, if the airbag has not deployed on the driver's side, you, you need to be careful that you don't get caught between it accidentally going off and the patient or some other hard surface. So we have a rule here, uh, um, and we call it the 15, 10, 12 rule, a 5, 10, 20 rule, I mean. So that's, um, and what that means is you wanna be five inches, 10 inches or 20 inches away. Um, and specifically it's, and when, you, when you're going in, you want to be five inches away or 15 centimeters from any of the doors so that those side airbags don't deploy and catch you. You want to be 25 centimeters away from the steering wheel in case that hasn't deployed, or you want to be 50 centimeters away from the passenger side dashboard. Um, this is how you can protect yourself from airbag deployment accidentally. And an airbag deploying on you um, can be really painful uh, and injurious. So uh, you want to keep that in mind. We don't use, um, um, what do they call them, like a harness that we used to use to put over steering wheels uh, so that if that steering wheel, if the steering wheel airbag hadn't deployed, doesn't, it kind of catches it. We stopped using those because they found that they were not reliable. And then when they would, when they would release, you'd end up having the metal from the thing, from the clamps that were holding the steering wheel breaking loose and injuring people. So, um, now you get to get in, now you're able to get into the car. You cut the cables, uh, so you have the cable cutters with you, hopefully. Um, and uh, oh, now we're on to a another quote: "Train, train, train. Try various techniques whenever you can. Train with various companies and brigades, and different kinds of apparatus, and always be safe when you're training." All righty, moving on. Okay, now we're accessing the patient. Um, you're gonna go through the door if you can. Remember, try before you pry. Talked about door lock and so forth. Um, now let's talk about taking out a window because you're gonna go, you, you have to go through the window. You know that it's really hard to break to get through the front window of the windshields. In order to get through windshields, you need to cut those. 
And we're gonna talk about some hand tools for doing that a little bit later, but you gotta cut to get through those. Um, side windows, now you can pop out by taking a sharp tool and hitting, pat, tapping in the corner, and then they'll, they'll just shatter into small pieces and you clear away the shards. And don't forget, use the power switch or handle if they're there. When you shatter the glass, you need to make sure that you are very careful to cover to protect your patient. Um, uh, glass part, glass uh, uh, particles are one of the most common wound contaminants for at motor vehicle accidents. What makes them especially problematic is that once once they're in the body, you know, in the bloody area, they're impossible to see once they're mixed with blood. They're invisible to X-rays. And they can't be irrigated out of the wound. So you have to be really, be really careful to make sure that you protect your patient from uh, getting um, any class shards into their uh, any uh, wounds or injuries they have. And remember, don't train till you get it right. Train till you can't get it wrong. Okay, so um, now we're talking about access. We've got access. Now we have to assess and then uh, assist the patient. And here's a um, here's a hand, two more handy little acronyms I borrowed from someplace else. Um, you're welcome to use them, adapt them as you see fit. Number, so you're gonna provide immediate life-saving treatment. And of course you're wearing proper PPE and if at all possible, that includes rubber gloves or latex gloves underneath your, your uh, utility gloves, whatever you're working with. Not always possible, understand, but if whenever, do make sure. So here's a little acronym, MARCH, stands for massive hemorrhaging. So is the person bleeding out? You're gonna have to stop, address the bleeding. Are they having airway difficulties? You're checking for those. Is there respiratory emergencies? Are there circulation problems? Are there head injuries? Whatever you use for your basic first aid responses, whatever, whatever uh, uh, terminologies you use, um, that, that's all fine. This is just something I found. I thought it was kind of cool. I wanted to share it with you. Adapt it, discard it as you see fit. But what is important here is number eight, the in-vehicle provider. Now, who's ever going inside the car needs to give what we call a CAN report. Now, CAN reports are useful not only in motor vehicle accidents, but when you're inside a burning building. This is basically what a CAN report is. What are the conditions where you are? In this case, because we're talking motor vehicles, what are the conditions inside the vehicle? What are the actions that inside you're gonna take? What are you gonna do? Letting people know. And what are your needs? So you're in there, you're either shouting out to someone, hey, here's what the conditions are inside the vehicle. Here's what I'm gonna do. Here's what I need. And by the way, don't forget to, uh, when you're taking care of victims in the vehicle, to look around and uh, along, allow, all around the vehicle to make sure that there's no one outside there that needs attention. So let's get into how do we do something without hand tools. So we're gonna talk about how do you force access, you're forcing access to the hood uh, to get back, to get to a battery or to attack a fire. To do that, I'm gonna show you a short video. There's no sound. Uh, it's coming. Wait, you don't hear you don't hear anything. Wait till I start. There's no talking just yet. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear it now? Firefighter with Bremerton. Yeah, we yes, can hear it. Okay. Uh, today we're going to talk about how to extinguish in different ways and scenarios to put out a car fire uh, if it's an engine compartment. So in the videos that we've been seeing when we've been uh training going to YouTube and whatnot. A lot of people like to go right at this and open up the grill um, to get to the little wires for the locking mechanism for the hood by doing a spin, which is great in a scenario like this where the car is not on fire. Um, but if it's smoky and you can't see the wires, you're just taking a shot in the dark, hoping that you get lucky. And also you're putting yourself either by being bent down or on a knee right in front of the, uh, the bumper. And we all know that we need to stay at a 45 if at all possible. Um, so then the bumper doesn't go flying at us. That's what I was talking uh, about another before. Thing that we've been saying is people like to make videos of taking out the, the headlights. We've tried that a few times. It doesn't seem to get much water into the engine compartment. 
especially if it's deep seated in the back here. Um, so what we'll do first is I'll show a quick, easy way of getting the initial attack down on the engine compartment. And then thereafter we can, after we've gotten the fire mainly knocked down, we can show you how to open up the hood for overhaul. So the best way I've seen in, in my experience is it's called rolling the hood. So you just take part of your halogen, snack it down, and you can just reach down with your shoulder, lift up on it, and it will make a nice open area where it lifts up the whole dash. And that will give the, uh, the person on the nozzle a nice, easy way to shoot in water on top of all the engine compartment where they can get all the deep seated spots. And then thereafter, we can open up the hood. So again, you just find a spot about six to eight inches up from the corner. You're still at a 45 degree angle, so you're in a safe spot down bark from here you can see you can get pretty much anywhere you want to inside the vehicle with the uh, the nozzle All right, now that we got the fire knocked down pretty good, now we can work on getting the actual hood popped open so then we can uh, work on overhauling. So first thing you always wanna do is the old try before you pry, come over here, find the hood, latch, and for this training scenario, we'll say it doesn't work. So that doesn't work, we go to the next one where we can do the... down in here, try and find where the wire's at. So that worked there. Put that up on about the business of putting it out okay so uh um that shows a way how to get into the into a hood when you, you can't get it from the inside or you need to get in but you saw it once you're in there if, if you want to disconnect the, the battery um there's two ways one you just pull the wires apart take them off but you do want to make sure that you keep them quite separated or if you cut them you want to cut them in such a way as to make sure that they can't accidentally touch so you make like a Two cuts in them so they're, they're really short and shorten them up um, and um, you always want to take the black the black, black wire off first that's that's your ground that's the first one you want to disconnect and then you take the cut, cut or disconnect the the uh the red so um we'll move on and uh, we're going to talk about how to remove a car door now without with hand tools you, you can't get it open it's it, it's stuck so uh, i'm going to watch this video real quick and it'll show you uh, a way to, to do that trick.
Okay, so um, you saw it. That's how you can remove a door with just using hand tools. All those tools that he did that with, you could carry in the pocket of your pants. Just want to point out one thing before I move on to, to uh, the next thing I want to show you. When you go to lay this, car, this door down, after you've taken it out, you want to put the outside, this side, you want to put that down. You want to do that for because if it, the airbag has not deployed and it's lying the inside side down on the ground and the airbag deploys, it could shoot that door up in the air and that could cause injury to you or to a bystander. So um, keep that in mind when you when you take a door off. So um, this is another real quick video on, on how to take out a window without any fancy tools. I'll we'll run through it real quick. Um, you, any, you probably have all kinds of tools on your truck. That Today I'm going to show you guys how to actually gain access into a vehicle, uh, assuming that the patient's not located in the same compartment or the same window that you're going to. Um, you know, actually work on the side window. It's going to replace using a center punch, a window punch. Um, I can go in with a flathead pickaxe and pull it only to uh, fail a day attempt. Bar. Any sharp pointed tool. There you have it. Easy as that. A lot safer than actually sitting there. Yeah, I don't know if you guys carry the center punches that he mentioned, um, but you know, you got to pop a window open. Now, let me let you in on a little something that I recently learned. Um, all new cars, at least being manufactured in, and sold in the United States, now have the, the side windows have the same kind of, of uh, laminated glass as the windshield, which means you can't do that with the tool that he's using. You have to cut them with a, with a saw. So I want to run through um, a bunch of hand tools that are really handy to have on your truck or even in some cases your pockets. Um, you saw them. With the, with the vice grip, you can pull back the, 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 the sheeting, a wrench, um, the, uh, you know, halogen bars. I don't know if you all carry, have halogen bars in all your trucks, but these are standard at all. all every fire department care, has a bunch of these. Um, you can even use something like a, like a lawnmower blade or, or a pry bar. Any of these tools would be useful for pulling, prying, gripping, or breaking. That'll help you get in. Um, some of these tools are easy to just, you could buy them at Walmart. This is for punching out glass. Uh, and it's also got, uh, I'm going to show you another, some cutting tools too, that you could easily get at, at, at Walmart. Um, here's some other tools that they're not power tools, but they might be readily available to you um, and with, you know, on a, at a, a car accident scene, car jacks, different kinds. These are kind of two different kinds here. And then there's one here. Um, useful for stabilizing to some degree, but also more importantly, you could use those to pry things and, pr and pull things apart. Come alongs, there's a kind of a, kind of a, um, a, a low tech pulley device. It'll give you a lot more, pre um, uh, you know, uh, leverage for pulling things apart. Um, farm vehicles often have these, tow trucks have these, and you might even have one in your truck there. And if you don't, they're easy to pick up at a, like, like a place, you know, any kind of store, they're easy. Um, don't forget to think in terms of tools from auto shops that might be nearby. A, um, a wrecker could be really useful to, to either help uh, pull cars apart, stabilize something, pull part, cars apart. Then you have um, torches. Uh, metal workers use torches. It, you could use a torch to cut if you have access to those things. And uh, remind yourself to train. Training is messing up here and not on the fire ground. I don't know about you guys, but too often I see people say, well, we didn't do so great on this call, but it was good practice for the next one. That's dangerous. All right, so you need cutting tools. You need cutting tools for the windshields. These are hand tools. Um, these are saws, uh, pretty readily available, not expensive, but they're critical for, for cutting out the laminated windshields. This is a Sawzall a power tool. Also, any place that sells hardware tools, you'll be able to get that for you. This little red tool over here is for cutting um, seat belts. If you don't have one, they cost they, they don't cost anything, a couple of dollars, and uh, it's worth having one to put in your pocket because it 
if these, the seatbelts have locks on them and it can be really hard to get someone out and they're also hard to cut. So seatbelt cutters are useful. So I'm gonna, run, I'm gonna wrap things up now. Um, I, wanna, I wanna close with three final quotes, uh, give you a couple, chance, a couple minutes to ask me questions. I can stick around for a little bit afterwards. Uh, I have another class I have to teach at uh, 11 o'clock, not a firefighting class, but another kind of class. So um, these are three quotes that I just wanna leave you with. I think they're really important. Um, whatever you do, don't be the weak link. Always be learning something new every day and training so that you, you're not the weak link on the fire ground. You know, faith in God is great. Uh, you know, Jose will tell you, faith, faith in God is great, but you got to trust in your training. Because when time is, when you, you can't count on miracles, but you can't count on your training. And finally, my all-time favorite quote is that this. We don't rise to the occasion. We fall back on our training. So this is just sort of like firefight, MVA, motor vehicle response 101. What do you do when you first get there? What do you do when you're using your basic hand tools? I'm pretty sure that Ed's going to take you deeper in terms of how to do things with power tools uh, to get people out from, you know, crushed, uh, crushed dashboards and things like that. So let me end my, uh, my sharing of the screen. And I see I one hand up. And, um, I'm totally happy to take questions and I'll stick around after a little while. And so, um, yeah, uh, Cyrus, do you want to ask, did you have a question? Cyrus, if you have a question, you can unmute and ask that now. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. We're here. Yeah, I'm experiencing a network problem. I don't know whether you are getting me clear. I hear you. Okay, I have a question. Uh, let us say, for example, one engine responded to a scene whereby we have the multiple uh, road accident. And then uh, <clears throat> let's say, for example, the crew is not enough to tackle the, the scene. Now, uh, my question is, what comes first? Uh, because we have this, uh, what we call golden hour, whereby you need to save uh, someone who is in danger immediately. Now, what comes in first? Is it extrication or you form a, a scene triage, first of all? That's my question. Uh, so let me make sure I, the last part I wasn't totally clear. Do you what comes first, the extrication of the patient or scene safety? Was was that? I think that was the question. Um, you you have to make the scene safe. Um, you it has to be safe for you and for the for the patient as 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 safe as you can make it with the resources you have. And there is no there is no easy answer to what do you do when you when you you don't have enough people enough, you don't have the inadequate number of people to respond to the, to the situation that you're faced with you you have to improvise um, and it, it'll all depend on where when um, you know, what's going on and you have to make the scene safe first you have to stabilize the the uh, the vehicle. Um, and then you have to get, you have to access and, and ex extract the person. Um, but every situation is going to be different. If, if you arrive on the scene and you're able to block the road, the car is on fire, there's someone inside and you're able to block the road and you, there's just, you don't have time because the person is the, the fire. You've got to do what you need to do to get the person out. But you have to you have to assess what's happening, um, and every situation will be different. So I don't know if that's a great answer to your for your question, but um, we we here, and especially in the volunteer fire world, are often responding to calls with inadequate resources, um, mainly human resources, but but also um, sometimes we just don't have enough. You know, it's too takes a long time to get the fire truck to the to the, to the scene, or or to get more than one fire truck. So you have to do what you have, what you can with what you have, and uh, that's where practicing 
and training it with scenarios where someone comes up with, hey, what if a situation? Um, so um, that's how I'll answer it. I see that there's there's a uh, questions in the chat. Let me see. Uh, uh, yeah, so okay. there is a question by Chief Mike in the chat, but we are at our one hour limit. And so don't worry, Chief Mike, we see the question, we'll answer that in tea time, but I do just want to transition us into that time right now. Um, okay. I just wanna thank you so much, Howard, for your presentation today. Um, and also, I know you said that you have a training soon, um, but feel free just to say as long or as little as you want, no pressure there. We just want to thank you so much for presenting today. Um, and I also want to thank everyone for coming and for participating um, in the training today as well. I want to remind everybody that this was recorded, so I'll post it on our YouTube channel a little later today or a little later in the week. Um, so you can view that whenever you want, just if you want another refresher um, on extrication and power tools. And I also want to ask everybody, I'm going to be sending a little evaluation in the chat here in a little bit. If you want to fill that out, that'd be really helpful for us. And I want to just pass it off to Jose now for tea time.